Uh, first of all, thank you for allowing us to speak and share ideas and, and think out loud about what it means to be a CEO in multiple continents. And so, welcome to New York. Um, how's your New York experience of the last two months moving from Paris to with your family here? It's been pretty hectic. I, I woke up one morning in May and I decided to move. Uh, and the logistics of moving wife, three kids, dog, nanny across was uh, challenging next to a daytime job. Yeah. Um, but we arrived, everyone's safe, everyone's happy, so it's good. Well, welcome. We're gonna kind of talk about sort of two cohorts of thinking. One is about what's it like to be a refounder in this case of your company, and then also just talk about you and your personal journey a little bit. So uh, you've taken over a, or you've joined as a CEO of a company that was established, having had a very significant exit prior to this in Asia. So you've had a lot of success as a founder. And now you're a refounder in a way with a team. Um, what's that like? How is your mindset different, and how is it alike? Um, to be fair, my mindset is not that different. I think as a as a CEO, which I would say is my primary role, both in the previous company and now, you know, I operate a certain way, and I haven't really changed the way I operate. And when I left Lazada uh, and was kind of trying to figure out what I'm doing next, I wasn't particularly saying, oh, I need to found something or I need to be a CEO. I was very much just looking at the bigger opportunity that I wanted to pursue. And when the Vestia opportunity came along, you know, it was exactly what I was looking for. And, and uh, if anything, I was happy to not go through those first you know, 12, 18 months of you know, eating shit uh, as, a, as a beginning of being a founder. The ball. The yeah, ball. The, the, yeah. The, you know, the very early stages when you're trying to connect printers and stuff like that. Um, so it's been, you know, very similar. I, you know, I feel as if I would be a founder from an ownership perspective. And if anything, you know, emotionally, I'm almost more connected to the current company than the previous company because I'm obsessed with the, the vision that we have mm -hmm. and, and how much the team rallies around the mission that we drive every single day. So it's, it's you know, it yeah. gives that extra boost of motivation that you're thinking, okay, I'm actually doing something good for the planet. Yeah. When you think about the level of care and obsession you have, like in, a, in this company versus your last one or how you would live your life today, at least I've found in my own uh, journey, which is the companies that I built and sold that worked is because I cared literally more than anyone in the world. And you have to care at that level. How do you develop that sense of care? Like how do you develop that sense of obsession in something that you're bringing that's sort of new to you but also exists in the world? I, I, I don't. I don't. I think I consciously develop that care. I think, you know, and, and the advice I usually give, you know, you know, young colleagues of mine who say, "Oh, I want to become a founder," I tell them whatever idea. You tell them don't. Don't do this. No, actually, it's a rational decision. I, I don't actually say that. I <laughs> say whatever idea you go after, be damn sure that you really believe in the yeah. idea that you believe that the idea can actually be big enough. Yeah. Don't just found for the sake of founding because it sounds cool on LinkedIn. Um, you know, do it because you really believe in it because there will be moments where, you know, your belief will be challenged and, you know, where you ask yourself, you know, what am I doing here? Yeah. Um, and then you need to fall back on that belief because otherwise you're gonna have a very hard time. I have friends who are sort of mid-career and they're kind of professionally burned out or bored and they're like, yep. you know, I wanna start my, I know my own company, I wanna be a founder and I'm like, I think that's a terrible idea. Like, I like, what, like if you're, it's like saying you're uh, you know, a lawyer and you become a surgeon or an entrepreneur, I'm gonna be a surgeon in the middle of my life. Like, it takes skill to do what you're doing and it has to you develop it towards that. Um, you know, you've committed and uh, as a company to some pretty incredibly important and high standards around diversity as well as sustainability in a business that has that but also doesn't really focus on those outcomes. How do you how do you preserve those commitments? How do you live them out? How do you think about them as a company? I mean the 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 core pillar of Vestiaire is sustainability. It's it's at the heart of what we do because we are de facto a, a circular business. And you know just some facts, you know, for every second hand item you buy, you avoid, you know, up to 90% emission because carbon emission, because most of the carbon emission happens when an item gets produced firsthand, and about 82% of purchases in secondhand avoid a firsthand sale. So, you know, our business is climate positive. Um, so it is at the heart of what we do. So, you know, around the ESG commitments and around the env env environmental part of ESG, you know, it's not so much that we're, you know, having to do so much to be 
climate positive. It's just at the heart of what we do, and it's more how much we talk about it, how much it's core of our um, you know, value proposition, our consumer uh, marketing. Um, you know, there are certain consumers who just don't care. They just mm -hmm. want to buy a nice luxury item for a cheap price. Um, but there's many who do. So I think that part is, is very um, central in everything we do. And if anything, you know, we, we can do even more and talk even more about it. On the diversity part, um, you know, and, and everything with regards to ESG standard, you know, we are, you know, we are in fashion. We are in luxury fashion. Um, you know, our consumers are extremely demanding on, on what behavior they expect of us. Mm -hmm. And because of the fact that we are, you know, putting ourselves on, on, you know, the top of the mountain with regards to environmental, I think we just need to be super careful and way ahead of the curve with regards to any expectations that we have. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of the, the pure kind of, you know, ESG storyline that we're telling. But what I tell my team around diversity, has, it has nothing to do with an ESG story we're telling. 90% of my customers are female. Yep. And, you know, one of the core reasons I kept, uh, you know, Fanny and Sophie, who are the two of the co-founders of Vestiaire, very close to me. And, and, you know, Fanny is the president of the business and, you know, co-leads the business with me uh, as much as, you know, I do in any given mm -hmm. day is because, you know, I don't understand 90% of our consumers nearly yeah. as much as she does. Um, so in an organization which is more than 60% female, 50% of our senior management is female, our board hopefully by the end of the year will also be 50-50 um, men, women. I think that's just, you know, good business. It's, it's not, I'm trying yeah. to hold myself to a standard. I think it's just the right thing to do yeah. from a business perspective. So how do, you, how do you make commitments to the company in the outside world to customers? You have obviously your marketplace that have integrity. Like, do you publish, how do you feel about the publishing of that transparency on those comments? Is that in the nature of keeping equipment like the, the diversity in this? I mean, one of, one of our values is transparent. And I think anyone who's ever spent any time with me you know, knows how serious I take that one value, yeah. for better or for worse, because I, I'm just incapable to not say what I'm thinking. Um, and that kind of reflects into the way, you know, I want the organization and the way the organization automatically then behaves. And for us to be transparent around you know, how we're doing on sustainability, how we're doing on diversity, how we're doing on trust. You know, the fact of the matter is we're doing a second-hand business. There is a piece of authentication that is happening. Um, you know, roughly one in 2,000 items is a fake, and sometimes we don't catch it, mm -hmm. um, you know, because maybe the authenticator had a bad day and he or her got, you know, dumped by her boyfriend or girlfriend the day before. Yeah. You know, things happen. But it's for us being very transparent and open about it and saying, you know, you know we fucked up. We yeah. can do this better. Um, so this kind of transparency and openness, I think, is just part of the culture, you know, which we choose and which I choose to have. And I think, you know, you can start being transparent in one part of the business and not transparent in the other. Yeah. So it has to be. Kind of so this is an interesting topic. I just had one uh, in a forum with a bunch of uh, post-exit founders I'm, I'm part of. And it was really about, well, that's about transparency, which is, so to what degree of transparency do you have inside the organization that you lead from that creates and abuse trust. So if you think about the decision rights yeah. or really how transparent, what does that really mean? I, again, I, I think too, this, this too, a tough one. probably too much. Um, yeah. I remember holding a town hall, I think it would have been April, May last year, so 2022. You know, at this point, you know, most people saw that things were not going the right direction from a macroeconomic perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just post Putin's war uh, in Ukraine and uh, you know, and I, and I increased the level of transparency in every town hall and every call I had and every email I wrote. And I said, guys, this is going to get bad. Yeah. You know, let's get ready for, you know, a serious downturn here. And, you know, fact of the matter is, you know, 90 plus percent of my staff didn't even work during the 2008 crisis. You know, <laughs> I think the total amount of people in my company who worked in 2001, 2002, including myself, I think were six. Six wow. people, not six percent. Mm. Um, you know, and if I look around in the room here, I don't think a single person has worked when interest rates were last time this high. So I think just the sheer ignorance that we've gone through over the last 12, 18 months of what is going on was quite staggering. So in these town halls, I kept on trying to raise the ante to make sure that people realize, hey, by the way, you know, party's over. 
Um, so with regards to transparency, I literally held a town hall where I didn't tell anyone what I was going to talk about, which freaked my senior management out because that's usually the scary thing. And I gave them literally an option. I said, I have two speeches prepared. One is, you know, I'm going to be as transparent mm -hmm. as I can possibly be, and you will be scared after that town hall. Or I can just pretend that everything is fine and tell you everything is going to be good, and let's just hang in there. You know, 90 plus percent of voted for the transparent speech. Afterwards, they were all completely freaked out and upset with me that I was so transparent. Um, but I do take that that part quite serious yeah. for for better or for worse. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, your teams ultimately they're there because they're trying to build and solve a need in the world and they want to be with you. So if you don't tell the truth, they don't know how to contribute. Yeah, and I mean, a, from my side, I think I'm, I'm a, you know, entrepreneurship has, has good and bad sides. Yeah. And I think right now we're really back to the core of what entrepreneurship is because, you know, it yeah. doesn't always go well. Yeah, it doesn't always go easy. So right now it's, you know, it's, okay. it's back to true entrepreneurship. So let's, I, I want to share one crazy statistic related to this, and then I want to ask you a burning question from mm -hmm. a friend who challenged me on this. So one is, I read an article, I think it was like two weeks ago, uh, Bloomberg, that said between 2005 and 2021 was the lowest cost of capital in the world in 5,000 years. So like our world is like almost artificial relative to the size and cost of capital, which we now are experiencing. So that's, that, these are outside forces, as you mentioned, geopolitical, financial, et cetera, kind of the fourth turning, the Ray Dalio type of thinking about this. So, and I remember a conversation I had in my last book with Reid Hoffman, who wrote the foreword of it, and I asked him, to what degree of all of your success, all the money in the bank, the billions, would you attribute to good fortune, timing, and things you don't control? And he's answered this, and I would ask you normally, he said, 80%. He said, we were there when it happens. Now we're smart, we worked our asses off, we had a lot of capital, we were the ones to win it. But we weren't early in debt and we weren't late and lost it. We were there because of the force. So that's an example of force. Like, how do you think about outside forces relative to your own success? And what do you think is the one now that's driving the business? I mean, there's absolutely no denying that, that there's a huge amount of luck and timing involved in, in yeah. the success of both the companies that I'm part of. Um, you know, whether it's 80%, whether it's 60%, I, I can't really give you that number. Yeah. You know, Reid Hoffman is much smarter than me. Um, but I think it's about seeing what are the bigger overarching themes that are independent of the latest fad. You know, I think in, especially in tech investing, you know, it's somehow every year there's one thing that everyone is running right. after. And it's literally now one year. You're not going to change you to a dot .ai company next week? Yeah. Gonna... Maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, and from my perspective, you know, I think it's on the one side these mega macro trends, um, but I think you need to figure out what these mega macro trends are. And I think when I looked at... Uh, Lazada, which for those of you who don't know, it was an e-commerce company which we built in Southeast Asia across Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam, so an area of about 600 million people. When I, I went there in 2012, there was just no e-commerce company there. Yeah. But for me, even today, you know, even though e-commerce is not the flavor of the month, you know, e-commerce is probably one of the most disruptive you know, plays in an industry or in, in, a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in an industry the size of retail, which I think is the second or third biggest industry yeah. in the world, next to I think natural resources, you know, it is the biggest trend over the last 20 years, and it will be the biggest trend for the next 20 years. So, from my perspective, you know, was I lucky that e-commerce took off in Southeast Asia the way it did, and that 150 million people entered the middle class while I was there? Of course, very lucky. Was I lucky that you know, you know, literally the moment I arrived, suddenly we had the Android 3G phones coming out costing $150 versus the $700 iPhone. Yeah. yeah, very lucky because then I spent the next three years selling you know, hundreds of millions of iPhones to those middle class who were using the iPhones with the app that we built to shop on us. Yeah. Is that a huge amount of luck? Yes. Did I believe that e-commerce was going to be one of the big, big trends? Yes, yeah. also. So I don't know how to weight that. If you think about my current company, you know, I'm still betting on e-commerce you know, mm -hmm. because I do think that it's you know, such a dramatic game changer and it's not offline versus online but it's what all of us do if i look around the room i think about you know three quarters of you have looked at your phone 
you know, at least 10 times in the last 20 minutes since I spoke. But not you know, my, my goal, Definitely even though you're looking at your phone. This is my, uh, <laughs> my pop quiz idea. I've got to, and my job is just to make sure that when you're looking at your phone, you're not looking at your emails, you're not looking at WhatsApp, right. but you're looking at these Vestiaire Collective and are seeing the latest item that's been sold. Yeah. So I think that's, that trend has not changed. And you know, frankly, it's the only thing I'm really good at. Um, I think the second part where I said, wow, this is you know, very unique uh, when I saw the Vestiaire opportunity and why I never questioned, you know, do I need to be founded, do I need to see it? Oh, it didn't really matter to me. Um, you know, was the part around sustainability. You know, there's so few companies out there which are truly sustainable, um, you know, without carbon offsetting and all that you know, BS. Um, and Vestiaire is one of them. And, you know, will that trend help us in five years, 10 years, 15 years? I can't predict that, but it will have an impact because at some point, you know, the biggest super trend that any of us are sitting on, and we can talk about AI all you want, yeah. but the one trend which is exponentially bigger and will have a much bigger impact than anything else is global warming. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, the planet is literally on fire underwater. Yeah. The impact is undeniable. And from my perspective, again, very simplistic, I stepped back and I said, you know, that's a, you know, building a business which is trying to be part of the solution. And I'm not kidding myself. I'm not saying I'm saving the, 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 the planet one hand back at a time, um, but we are changing again, one of the biggest industries, which is retail. And retail and fashion is, you know, depending on the statistics, the second or third most polluting industry out there. You know, we're bringing a solution, we're educating consumers around changing that. And for me, that's, you know, a good business opportunity then. Yeah. This is the fastest interview of my life. It's like with three minutes left, and it was like, okay. it's, it's like the Inception movie or something. Um, When you think about the proprietary gift of the company, when you think about the outside forces, and you, I, well, my last company was back to the Founders Fund, and they always said that competition's for losers. You have to create something that's so radically differentiated in the world. I'll try to do this in a minute and a half, because I have one more question I'm going to ask you of the 10 mm -hmm. more. Um, how are you truly creating something relative to the comparables in the space that's impossible to replicate, that's one of one, where you ignore the noise and you, you lead the team into a future that's inevitable? It's, it's yeah. inevitability that this is going to happen. You know, I think. At, at our core is our community of fashion lovers. I mean, that, that it, it, no one else has anything comparable. We've built this business, and I, I'm saying we in a very royal we because I didn't build the business for the first 10 years, and, and Fanny and Sophie have. They've built this incredible flywheel of fashion lovers who are selling the most beautiful items in the world uh, to the most passionate buyers in the world. You know, I met one of our customers 10 days ago. You know, it's a consumer influencer who's obsessed with Terry Mugler, and she spent, you know, 35 minutes of our 45 minutes meeting telling me how, you know, amazing Terry Mugler pieces she finds from the show, you know, winter show 1989. Um, you know, and I pretend that I know what she's talking about. Um, you know, that's our power. And, yeah. and that's why I joined Vestiaire. That's the third pillar next to e-commerce, next to sustainability. It's that social community piece where I, th I thought, you know, I'm coming from Asia where social commerce is normal. You know, while in the West, you know, the US or Europe, we also think that Amazon mm -hmm. is very unique, which, you know, you know, I ask myself, what has been that innovative if I go onto the, the yeah. Amazon app over the last 10 years, apart from shipping even faster, faster, faster. Yeah. Um, that social commerce piece, connecting the buyers and the sellers, creating community, creating engagement, creating gamification, you know, that's really what we're doing. That's how we're keeping that community engaged. I'm going to ignore this because I have one more bonus question. Okay, go for it. It's probably like the warning sign anyways. Okay. Okay, so on the drive-in, when I was like using my phone while yeah. I was driving, sort of driving, I read this article about this very famous uh, soul singer named Bill Withers who wrote that, wrote that song, Ain't No Sunshine. You guys probably know that one, Ain't No okay. Sunshine. You know? So he, he quit the music business at age 47. He, was, okay. he worked in, as a janitor, started as 31, had his huge success, and he's like, I'm out. And he said, he said he quit because at the, the Hall of Fame induction, he said he claimed he had no regrets by providing the following reflection in his later life. I've always been serious th this way, trying to evolve to a more conscious state. Funny about that, though. You tweak yourself, and you're looking for more love, or more lust, more compassion, less jealousy. You keep tweaking, adjusting those knobs until you can no longer find the original settings. The capital and the music forced the original settings away from me. So you're a founder. You have half a billion dollars in front of your cap table. Yeah. How do you not lose the artist's way in all this? How do you keep the original settings for yourself? How do you not quit? <laughs> 
That's a deep question, <laughs> and I have like 30 seconds to answer it. Um, Minute 30. You know, I, I just love what I do. I think yeah. that's the, the most important part. You know, I'm, I'm complaining about what I do. It doesn't mean I'm not tired. I don't get frustrated and, and paranoid and pessimistic. Um, but I just love what I do because, you know, every meeting I have with one of our consumers who tells me how much they love our brand, yeah. every meeting I have with one of my teams where they're showing me what latest cool A-B test they did gives me so much, you know, intellectual stimulation and, and joy, you know, in what change I am bringing, you know, to my microcosm that I'm operating in. Like, what else am I going to do? Yeah. I mean, it's as I simple it. as that, right? I, yeah. I, you know, of course I can say I'm going to go back to university or I'm going to start investing or whatever, but that's not who yeah. I am. I think who I am is just bringing that change in, in my little way and, and you know, yeah. why would I, I would do anything else? I would say you else? still have it. Thank you for this. Thank Thanks, so Max. Appreciate it. Thank Great you. real.